knowledge of who He is. And may that knowledge of who He is grow us in our faith. So that when we leave here, we'll leave here with a faith that's stronger. A faith that can shine bright for the world so others can see Christ in us, as we just sang. And so Terry and I are thankful that you allowed us to come back. And, and uh, I told David this week, I said, I hope you eat a good breakfast because I'm preaching. And so we'll pray that if I hear any stomachs growling, I'm going to call you out in the middle of the message. But we want to thank you for letting us come. And it's a joy to be back. And even though we're not here very often, you guys are our family. And you've been our family ever since we have started working with Pastor Kyle and Sue and, and Philip and Amy. And so thank you. I've rewritten my introduction about six times to this message. But what I want you to do, I want you to look up, look left, look right, look down, look all around you. Do you see God? He's here. Whether we see him or not, he's here. In fact, he's everywhere. And if we know Jesus Christ as our savior, he's inside of us. Look at the person nearest you. Do you know what they're thinking or what they did last night? God knows. Tomorrow we begin another work week. Do we know what's ahead of us? Do we know what we're gonna face? He knows. God knows everything. In fact, he knows exactly the day that we're gonna spend our last day on earth. He knows exactly the day we're gonna die. And what I wanna look at today is this wonderful example of who God is. The other thing I want us to realize is that God made us. And when we look in the mirror, he made us exactly the way he wanted us to be made. Now, I'm not talking about our spiritual nature, our sin nature. I'm talking more of our physical nature. We're made in the way that God desired us to be made. So when we look in the mirror, we shouldn't desire change physically. One of the biggest businesses in, at least I know in the States, is plastic surgery, where people are always trying to change their appearance. But listen, God made you physically exactly the way he made you. You were formed, as we're going to see in Psalm 139, we were, you were formed in your mother's womb. We don't need to depend on what the world says that we should supposed to look like. Seems like that changes over the decades, doesn't it? Who's pretty, who's not? You look at some of the pictures of the people who were pretty back in the 1700s, aren't the people who are pretty today. Who tells us all those things? Well, it's the world that tells us that. God tells us that we're made in his image. We're made spiritually in his image so we can have a relationship with him, although sin stops that. But physically, we're made the way he wants us to be made. And so we should seek to be exactly who he wants us to be. Today we're going to look at Psalm 139. And this psalm continues to help me through difficult times. Lately, you know, we've had some physical issues. And thank you for praying. My, I think I'm no longer stoned. <laughs> I used to say it's not good to have a pastor who's stoned and, and, and hope in Christ. I had kidney stones, if you don't know what that would say. And finally, praise the Lord, it's gone now. And the pain is gone and the ordeal. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your prayers for Terry as she is still cancer free and we're praising the Lord for that. Um, but these, this psalm has gotten me through much, not just lately, but through my whole Christian life. It's been one of the key chapters in my life. And I want us to see today that when we focus on him, when we realize who he is, as I said at the beginning, we should be able to leave here with a different perspective on what's out there. Because what's out there doesn't define us. It's what's in God's word and who he is that defines us. And we're to show the world who we are in Christ. You'll be pleased to know that that was my first page. <laughs> I won't tell you how many pages I have left. But let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to get started looking at this psalm. Father God, we just praise you. As we've already sang, Lord, I pray that you were pleased in what you heard. Not only what you heard, but Lord, I, praise, I pray that you were praised with our hearts as we sung it. I thank you, Lord, for the testimony we had today. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the teachings that we've already had. Thank you for the focus we've had on missions and what you're doing in other parts of the world. And I pray that we don't fall prey to being a comfortable church as have happened to some. And Lord, we just look to you today now. As we just sang, Lord, speak to us. I pray that as you help me teach your word that you speak in and through me, but that your word also speaks to me so that when I leave here, I leave changed as well as everyone else that's here. I pray, Lord, you would speak to us right now through your word. Encourage us, convict us, we're needed, and build us because it's your desire that we one day 
will be perfect. But until then, you're completing the work, you're doing the work in us. And Lord, help us to allow you to do that. Help us to allow you to lead us in the way everlasting. So thank you again for your beautiful word. Thank you that it's not just to know what you say, but it's to know you. And Lord, I pray today that that's our focus. So thank you again for all you do for us. And we pray you would work now as you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to look at five things in Psalm 139. We will look at the whole chapter. The first thing we're going to look at is verses 1 to 6, that God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows what's happening. He knows everything. My dad used to tell me when bad things were happening, he says, what do you think, Jim? God's up there going, oh, no, I didn't see that happen. God allows it because he loves us and he's using everything to build us. The second thing we're gonna see is God is with you, always. The third thing we'll look at is he perfectly made you. And again, I'm not talking about the spiritual, I'm talking be satisfied who you look like. Don't compare yourself to others. Fourthly, when we know God and his word, we'll start to see the world in sin as he does. See, our knowledge of God will cause us to change how we look at the world and what it offers. And then lastly, a correct biblical view of God will always help us see ourselves as he sees us. And we'll seek to correct him to correct us as he desires. So let's take a look at this psalm. The first point again, God knows you. Let's look at verses 1 to 6. He says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now, when we finish with verse 1, that's either a comforting thought this morning or it's not. Depending on where we are in our spiritual walk, eh? And it's actually that way depending on where we are in our day, isn't it? What our attitude is, what our heart's like, it depends on that. But David says here, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. Behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. So we see all this complete, perfect knowledge of who God is. And the fact that he, because he's omni, omniscient, he knows everything, he knows us. In fact, I believe he knows us better than we know ourselves. And again, as I said, that should be both comforting, and to me it's, it's comforting, or it can be a little scary this morning, depending on where we are in our walk with Christ and in our obedience to him. But then verses 5 and 6, not only does David say, you know me, but look what he says in verse 5. He says, you have hedged me behind and before. The idea of a, a hedge, we used to have uh, some neighbors that, that had perfect hedges. You ever have those people that have perfect hedges? Don't you hate them? <laughs> because mine always had things coming up and sticking around and you know, I, Terry will tell you that yard work was not one of my favorite things. It was then I didn't like God's creation. But the idea of a hedge here is protection. Now here in South Africa, you know, I, I love going door-to-door -door evangelism, but boy, it's difficult. I, it's hard for me to climb over the fences now to get to the door. But, but God has hedged us. You were talking about the dangers in Fasantra Crawl. People in the States, when we were back reporting on the ministry there, were asking us, aren't you afraid to go in? Well, listen, we go in with diligence. We look around, we watch, but yet if God desires us to be there, I believe, verse 5, he's hedged us. He's protected us. And if I do go and die, he already knows that the day I'm going to die, so I'm not going to go before he says so. And so David says, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Does that give you peace this morning? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only is your eternity secure, you're secure right now in everything. Even the trials he allows, he's perfectly made them for you. So his hand's upon you. And then he says in verse 6, and I hope you're saying the same thing after looking at these first five verses. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Guys, i got to tell you, if, if the other day, uh, Friday, so that was two days ago, Terry was meeting with Kalula, and I, I told Kalula, I said, watch out, I'm in a bad mood today. And I was, I kind of woke up grumpy. I think I knew that Suzelle was coming later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Francois, I liked that one, didn't you, Francois? All right. So, but listen, I had a bad mood because I lost focus. You see, when you think about who God is and what he's done and who he is to us, we should never be in a bad mood. 
Even David, the psalm I was, I was reading this morning, he starts off, you know, the chapters before that, he's starting off with, oh, they're trying to kill me, they're chasing me. But then he says, but praise God, because when he puts his focus back on him and away from everything around him, you can't help but praise him. That's if you know him as your Lord and Savior. We're going to talk about that at the end if you're not sure today that you're saved. So when we look at our emotional barometer this week, and we, if we can say, if you're honest with like I was honest, I'm in a bad mood, hopefully God will let us see that we need to get our focus straight. Because of who he is and because of everything we just read, that God who's with us, the God who knows what we're going to say next, he even knew I was going to say I'm in a bad mood. And he knew he was going to convict me when I said it. But God is there. And he knows everything. And we see in Hebrews chapter 4, you guys know this passage well, because I know it's one of Pastor Cal's favorite, favorite passages. We have a high priest who knows us better than we know ourselves, and he knows exactly what we're feeling. Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16 says, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was all in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Have you ever said that God doesn't understand what I'm going through? He doesn't know what I'm feeling. He doesn't know how I feel when that person's rejected me. He doesn't know what I feel when I'm, I'm, I don't, my physical body hurts. He doesn't know what's going on. Oh, yes, he does. He can sympathize with our weaknesses because in the miracle of miracles, when God became man, that hypostatic union, Jesus joined forever body and, and, and God. We have the infinite God man. And he did so so that he could be tempted, Matthew chapter 4. So he understands what it's like to be tempted. Now he doesn't understand what it's like to sin because he, in his godness, he couldn't sin, but he was tempted in his humanity. He was starving, he was hungry, he was tired, he was. You know, at the end of his temptation in Matthew 4, it says that the angels had to come and assist him. He was that close to death. So don't tell me he doesn't understand what we're going through. My kidney stone pain had to be something small compared to what Jesus faced on the cross physically. So he understands. So when we go to him, we have a savior, a high priest who understands everything about us. Then the writer of Hebrews says in verse 16, So because of that, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may, may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. Jesus knows us intimately and completely. Since he is God, he's omniscient. But because he's man, he knows exactly what we're feeling. And I believe that's what David was thinking about. The God of the universe knowing him. Jesus even knows what our greatest fear is. He knows what it's like to die. And because he conquered death, guess what? We as believers conquered death as well. And so we don't have to fear that either. Sometimes I fear the process, I'll be honest. But I don't fear it. God knows everything about you. He knows what we're going through. He knows our past, our present, and he knows our future. Seek him and trust him. You'll not be disappointed. Your faith in him will be rewarded. Hebrews eleven six says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. But listen to what it says next. But he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I was smiling, you know, to me, I was smiling during the testimonies today and some of the scripture. I'm saying, how do they know that what I was going to talk about? Well, God knew. David read that, that when we seek, we draw near to God. Guess what? He draws near to us. And he's always with us, but we, we, when we draw near to him, we finally get the benefit of that relationship, don't we? We could stop there in, in those first six verses in Psalm, but we're not going to stop. Let's keep going. He knows us. The second one we're going to look at, we looked at his omniscience. Now we're going to look at his omnipresence. God is with you. God is everywhere. Verse 7 says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or shield, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. 
Do you notice David's intimacy with God? He's always talking about him being with him. My God, his right hand holds me. You see, if we want to have victory in Christ, we need to ask God to help us to build this intimacy, the knowledge of him. Because then he could confidently say here in verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall lie about me, and the deed, indeed the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as a day, and the darkness and light are both alike to you. So listen, David's saying, listen, God, I can't go anywhere where you're not. So when you go across the aisle at work to share the gospel, we know Matthew 28, Jesus says, I'll be with you. But here again we say, he says he's with us. He's always with us. When we go out into the dark world, the light of Christ is with us. He is with us and he goes with us. Do we have this confidence? Do we really believe that our savior is with us? Then why do we get afraid and worried and overcome by our circumstances? <laughs> Philippians chapter four, verse six, it says, be anxious for nothing. It's a command, why? Because it's a sin to forget <laughs> that he's there, that he's all powerful. Why are we afraid? Why do we try to do things in our own strength and not turn to him? Nothing in this world can give us the confidence and security that we need. Only God does that. Only our savior, if we know Christ does that. And he's the only one who can promise that his presence will be with us forever. There have been great people who've helped me grow in Christ over the years and many of them, as I'm getting older, many of them have already went home to be with him. They're no longer with me, but the Savior, the Lord they talked about, the God that they live for, the God that they showed me in their life, he's still here. He's with us always. Therefore, we shouldn't fear anything that we face or challenges that may come. Keep our eyes on him. He will certainly lead us in the very best way possible. And wherever he leads us, in the darkest of times, no matter what they are, guess what? As David said, his right hand holds us. He's with us. He's there. I know some of you have faced difficulties this week. And whether you knew it or not, you didn't face them alone. And I hope that when we leave here today, we realize that nothing we're going to face, we're ever going to face it alone. And listen, I wish I could stand here and tell you today that I always have this right, <laughs> but I don't. There's times I forget it. There's times I allow worry and anxiousness and discouragement to take over, fear. But that's why I think it's so important for you and I to be in God's word because we need to be reminded of who he is. And that he builds our faith. We shouldn't let our busy schedules push them aside. We shouldn't let anything to allow us to forget that he's there. But we should always seek him and talk to him wherever we are, knowing that he's inside of us, he speaks with us, he's with us. Every believer has the Holy Spirit inside of them. Paul says that in Romans 8 9, but if you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now look what he says in verse 9 of Romans 8. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. You and I, if we know Christ is our savior, we have him inside of us. And because of that, the Holy Spirit will illuminate God's word for us. He'll, he'll help us understand it. He's leading us to make decisions according to the word of God. Now we don't always allow him to lead us, but he wants to lead us to make those right decisions. You have difficulties this week. There's things you need to decide what to do. What do you do first? Do you pray first or do you call somebody else? Because whatever you do first, I remember my dad and my pastor telling me this as a young man, because wherever you turn first is what you're trusting in. And we're to turn to him first. He's in us, he's with us. Back to Psalm 139, verses 10 to 12. He says, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be as light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. I learned this over 50 years ago. Well, I've learned over the 50 years, I'm sorry, that I've been saved that no matter where I am, no matter how dark things seem to be, when I turn to him, things brighten up. It gets better. To him, the darkness shines like the day. 
So regardless of my circumstances, God is with me. As believers, we need to remember God is ever-present. We can call on our intimate Savior in our darkest trials, knowing that He knows what we're going through, He understands, and He's with us always. My third point is God perfectly made you. Look what He says here. Verse 13, For you form my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. When we look in the mirror and say, oh, I think God made a mistake. Look at me. He doesn't look at you that way. He says, I made you that way. You see, contentment is not just with what we have. It's with who we are. Now, I do believe that those who have beards like David and Tyron and me are more spiritual and, and J.J., Oh, and Werner, <laughs> and others. I'm just kidding, but we should be pleased with who we are. Look what he says. He says, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How many times in school did you have somebody cause you to doubt that because of their meanness? Marvelous are your works, and that includes when you look in the mirror. Who decides who's handsome and who's beautiful? It's the world. Who's the rule of the world? Satan. We should be content with how God made us. Because I don't know about you, he doesn't make mistakes. I do. If I make something, don't be content, don't trust it. If I make a chair, don't sit in it. But if God makes us, don't you think he knows what he's doing? Oh, yes, we live in a fallen world. Yes, our bodies have the effects of sin, but the way he made us is exactly what he wanted. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me. As I said earlier, God already knows when we're going to die. When as yet there was none of them. How precious are you, your thoughts to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. But how precious are your thoughts to me. How great are the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Here we see that God not only knows us, not only is he only with us, but that he made us. We're not products of millions of years of evolution. We're made in the image of God. Therefore, we're made to have a relationship with him that sin destroyed. But as believers in Christ, we're, we were reconciled with him. And now he's not only our creator, but he's our father. It says in Ephesians, Paul says, we're adopted into God's family. We're not cosmic accidents, products of millions of years. Rather, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's sad that much of the world is not happy with that. As I said earlier, plastic surgery is a big business. People decided that God even made a mistake when he made them what sex they are. You see the, the, the post-modern, the, the woke mentality today is a direct offense to God and his word. It says God didn't know what he's doing. And that's the whole idea of the world. The world wants us to doubt God and who he is. That's the same attack that Satan gave Eve when he said God just doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't have your best interests at heart. He doesn't know. Well, yes, he does. And he made us the way he designed it. And the world is constantly fighting against that. I don't need to get into particulars. We know what they are. But it's wicked. Because it says God made mistakes, and he doesn't. God created us, and when we were saved, he recreated us. Now, you hear us pastors sometimes tell you, you need to read the Bible, you need to live like Jesus, you need to do, and that's, that's true. And we tell you, you're not saved by that, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for you're saved... For by grace are you saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So our salvation is a gift. But then what he says in verse 10 is the same thing that Jesus says in John 3. You must be born again. Because he says that when we're born again, look at verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. As a believer, do you realize that not only are you physically created by God, but you were spiritually recreated, born again by Him? And just like David says here in the Psalms that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, we were born again in the, in the process of sanctification, that we're to continue now to seek to be more like Christ. We're now set apart from the world, set apart to Christ. And as we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, that one day he'll complete it. It says, being confident, Paul writes, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, when I said that we shouldn't look in the mirror and doubt how God made us physically, we, we, we should look in the mirror of his word, though, and listen to what it says about how we are spiritually. When God's word shows us that we're not right spiritually, we're not to be content. <laughs> we're to say, okay, help me. Help me change. We should live for him. We should seek to be like him. And back to verse 17 and 18. I told you I was going to go back to there. David says, because he's so amazed at God's omniscience and his omnipresence, and the fact that he's a creator, he says, your thoughts are amazing to me. Verse 17 says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Here we see that David was both overwhelmed and comforted by God's knowledge. He says, how precious are your thoughts to me. And it, was, and it didn't matter what his circumstances were. God's thoughts were still precious. Ask ourselves a question. How precious are God's thoughts to us today? Are you listening to his word right now or are you thinking what you're going to have for lunch? And by the way, you can tell how precious his thoughts are you to you about how much you were in his word this week. How much were you talking to him in prayer, asking him for wisdom and guidance? Because that's really how precious his thoughts are to us, isn't it? We could say that, oh, Lord, I love you and, and your thoughts are precious to me, but yet I don't read your love letter to me and I don't talk to you. Which one speaks louder? Our actions or what we say? How precious is he to us? Yes, precious involves obedience and those things, but I believe, like we said this morning, that we're to seek him. Draw near to him. And I gotta tell you, as David does here, when you draw near to him, he becomes more precious. You know, I, See, I'm going off my notes, David, which is bad. When I was, when Terry and I were first married, I was working two jobs. And I was a deacon in our church and being trained for ministry. And so I was busy. But my second job at night was at a jewelry store. And uh, I, got, I got to be there at night, which is, by the way, the best time because that's when everybody was off work. So I actually set the record for sales because I was there at the best hours. And so when the district manager would come in, he'd say, you guys, he was from the South, you guys need to be more like Jim. Jim, look at his sales per hour. And they, were, they didn't say it to him, but they're saying to themselves, yes, but he's working the best hours. He's not here in the morning at 10 o'clock when no one else is in the mall. But I got off track. What amazed me most about the jewelry store is I started to, I was gonna, before God led another direction, I was going to learn and get my gemology certificate and learn about how to grade diamonds and the Keller and, and the clarity and, and all those things. Uh, you have Keller, which determines the, the quality of the diamond, and the clarity, how many inclusions it has, and those kind of things. And what you had to do, though, is you got to take a look at some of the diamonds, the engagement rings, and you put them underneath a microscope. And you got to see them. And oh, some of them were just beautiful. The facets and, and the color and the clarity and the clearness of them. And then you took them out and you held them up into the light and they sparkled. When we get this book out, we get to see the most beautiful thing there is. We should close our Bibles every day, not until we go, wow, God, you're something. Because again, I, I believe firmly, this isn't a book of the do's and don'ts. It's a book of who. And when we know who he is, then the do's and don'ts become clear. Especially after we're saved, the more we know him, the less we want to sin because we know how wonderful he is and how much he loves us and how much we love him and why in the world would we want to hurt him. 
How precious is he to you today? Last yesterday at the youth group, we were looking at Psalm 22, the Messianic Psalm, but I asked him to tell me things they knew about God. And people mostly said about what the, he did for us. But that's not the point. The point is who he is. Go home today when you, when you leave here, if you're still awake. Go home and after lunch, try to write as many things you know about God and see how long your list is. And I'll guarantee you this, no matter how long it is, it ought to be longer. My list too. Because he's infinite. And we can never stop knowing him. We'll never know him all. Even in glory, when we're in heaven, we're not going to know him. We'll know him perfectly because we'll know him without sin. But we won't know him completely because of who he is. I'm looking at something to skip over to help you. So when we know God in his word, we'll start to see the world in sin as he does. Let's look at verses 19 to 22. You notice how David says in 17 through 19, how precious are your thoughts to me. And he's talking about his knowledge of God. Well, look how he sees the world then, verse 19. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. You go, you. Have you ever read that? You go, ooh, David. Well, maybe that's why he'll say at the end, search me, O God, and know my heart. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the point I wanted to see here, though, is when he looked at the world and how they hated God, it caused something in him. He wasn't like some of the churches today. Well, no, let's invite them in and include them in everything they do and say it's okay. No, because sin is sin and God is God. And so when we get to know God better, we're going to look at the world differently. We're not going to be inclusive. Oh, we still will go out and share the gospel to everybody we can because they're only that way because they need Jesus. My pastor used to say, don't complain about the lost until you share the gospel with them. Because if you've done nothing to change them, you have no right to complain. But we shouldn't agree with everything that's going on. We should hate it. Because God hates it. He doesn't hate them. He died for them. For God so loved the world. But the sin he hates. How much do I hate sin? Let's look at your Netflix history. <laughs> Terry and I, are, we, we, we try to find things on Netflix, but we're, we said we've got to cancel our subscription because there's hardly anything on there anymore. Even documentaries about certain things are jaded now towards the world's beliefs. So we're going back to Andy Griffith. He's, Andy's good. He's solid. Right? But you see the point. What are we letting in? And what are we allowing the world to change our mindset? You see, if we're focused on God and who he is, that won't happen. Because we'll try to see the world as he sees it. So the more we know God, we'll see the world differently. Oh, and like I said, we're also not going to see it so fearfully either. We're going to go out into the world confident knowing that God knows what's going to happen today. And he's there. Lastly, look at verses 23 and 24. Now, I have them memorized in the King James, I think, Tyron. You can check me if I'm wrong. But he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I like that because the King James uses the word, see if there be any wicked way in me. Some versions say anxious thoughts. But I think David just got done speaking of wickedness. I think he meant more wickedness here. In other words, the last point is this. A correct bi biblical view of God will help us see ourselves in a correct biblical way. Let me say that again. That was a mouthful. A correct biblical view of God will always help us see ourselves in a correct and biblical way. We'll pray this prayer. Because I believe this is a prayer. And I pray it often. I can't tell you I pray it every day. But boy, at least several times a week. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Well, how can I say that? Because I trust the perfect God of the Bible who knows me 
He knows the words of my tongue before I'm even going to speak them. He knows my circumstances. He knows what I'm, the trials are. He knows my temptations. He knows everything I'm facing. And he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. He even says, try me. Test me. Go ahead. And know my thoughts. See if there's anything in me you don't like. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The problem is if we don't work on our knowledge of God, we're going to have a hard time praying that and being honest. You've heard me say before when I was praying for Terry's cancer for the first six months probably. I would pray, God, heal my wife if it's your will. But for the first six months, I was lying to him. Because I didn't trust that his will was best. I knew what I wanted. But it was actually Terry who helped me see that no matter what happens, God is good. And finally, honestly, I could pray, but your will be done. But it wasn't until I was completely sure that because he's good, perfect, right, holy, just, faithful, kind, he loves me more than I can ever know. Because of that, his will's got to be perfect, good, right, and in love. It has to be. If he allows it, it has to be that. James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above the Father of lights. That means trials are good. And oh, by the way, then it says, in whom there's no variation or shadow of change. Guess what? Everything we read about God this morning in Psalm 139 is going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Oh, you may have saw me Friday morning. I was in a bad mood. <laughs> I hope today I changed. I hope I didn't come in as a bad mood. So you don't know sometimes how you can approach people. Have you ever had people at work, you're, you're, when you win their office, you're, you're kind of looking to see, what are they going to be today? Are they going to be nice today or are they going to be that bear that they were yesterday? But we can get on our knees before our Lord God creator and say, oh, thank you. You're always the same. Guys, how do you know them today? If you're saved... Can you really tell me at least 20 things about God? Not about what he's done. My pastor used to ask me, how's your walk with the Lord going? I'd tell him, well, I was out witnessing this week. I did this. I taught this. I did this. He said, I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you what you did. I said, how's your walk with the Lord? What he was trying to tell me is, is how's my relationship with him? He wanted me to talk about him. Not about what I did. He wanted me to talk about him. And that should be our focus. Not what we do. You heard me say this before. It's not the do, do, do. It's the who, who, who. Now, if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ, I hope this psalm is speaking to you like it does me. Because of who he is, he's always going to do what's best. All we have to do is seek him, obey him, and allow him to lead us. You see, that same right hand that David was talking about was with him in trouble is the same right hand that wants to lead us. I've grown over the years less legalistic as I grow older in my faith in Christ. And I believe this now. Obedience is not, I've got to buckle up and do. You know, Nike says, just do it. Obedience is when I, when I grab his hand and I say, lead me. If I let him do that, if I trust him enough to do that, obedience won't be an issue. It's not about how hard I try to obey. It's because the more I know him, I trust him and I love him and I want to obey. My heart changes because he changes it. If I'm trying to change it myself, that obedience, you know, legalistic churches, uh, Terry's churches who grew up and believed in work salvation, and man, now please, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just stating fact. Some of those people later in their lives, oh, they, they wore the right prayer veil and they had the right shirt with no tie on and they didn't have TV in their house but my goodness the world exploded because the more you focus on the don't the more you want to do it that's what Paul says right I look at your law and, and I wouldn't know what covetousness is unless your law told me and he, you know, he basically say now I covet you know, stop it you tell a child don't touch it what they want to do see if we focus on the do all the time that's wrong Satan's going to use it because our eyes are off Christ. But if we focus on him and say, lead me, those things aren't even going to be in our mind. Because he's filling our mind and filling our heart. I pray that that's where you are today. Pray for me that that'll be me. 
And guess what? That's a day-by-day, minute-by-minute basis. None of us are going to get it right until we're in glory. And then, you know, I, I picture... By the way, the singing was beautiful today. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. But can you imagine being in glory when you're singing? And let's say somebody's singing louder than you are. You're not going to think to yourself, huh, what do they think they're doing? <laughs> or look how they came to... Look at Pastor Jim. He's got suspenders on. He doesn't have a tie. You're going to be worshiping him perfectly because there's no sin. But in the meantime, you know, it says in John chapter, that fact, let's close with John chapter 1. Or 1 John chapter 3. <laughs> Sorry. 1 John chapter 3. Listen to this. And it, do you ever notice that the writers of the Bible have the same heart? <laughs> Look what John writes. Sounds like David almost, doesn't it? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Isn't that what David was saying in a lot of ways? That we should be called children of God. He's like, behold, look at that. We're children of God. He's amazed by that. Are you amazed by that? When you look in the mirror, yeah, I'm a child of God. He saved even me. But then it says, therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now isn't there a picture of that? That they know us, they don't know us because we know them? The more we know him, it doesn't say they don't know us because we have a list of rules we keep. It says they don't know us because they don't know him. And they don't know us because we know him. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Guess what? There's going to be a day when this sin is gone. We'll be like him. For we shall see him as he is. But then look what he says next. He doesn't say, until then, just sit back in your recliner and wait. He says this, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. You see, our hope in him, because of who he is, we should seek to purify ourselves while we wait for him to completely purify us. Now, if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, I got news for you. Everything I just talked about means nothing. Zip. You should have just slept. But I hope you're awake now. Because here's what I want you to know. God loves you more than you can ever know, but he hates your sin. God's holy. He's perfect. He's just. Therefore, he can't allow sin into heaven, and he must punish sin. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all. When I was told to eat all my peas, I had to eat them all. And they didn't know about the ones the dog ate. <laughs> but all means all. For all have sinned. Me, everyone. Except Jesus. The only man who never sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of his standard, perfection. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're not. But, the Bible says as well, that the punishment, the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, that's what sin brought into the world, but spiritual death. You're now spiritually dead without Christ. We're not going to get into that, but you'll be spiritually dead forever in a place called hell if you don't trust in him. But praise God that verse doesn't end there for the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say full stop. Instead of full stop, it says but. And if you really believe that this morning, if you really believe this morning that you're a sinner and you don't know Jesus Christ and you deserve his punishment, then when I say but, you should open your eyes and go, what's next? I need to hear this. But. The gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid it all. God demonstrates his love for us, and while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Verse 13 says this, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're here today and you're admitting to God now you're a sinner, you believe he, you deserve his punishment, then you need to believe that he took his, your punishment for you. He died for you, rose again, so he could save you. And he wants to do that today. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ, I pray today will be the day that you give your life to him. And then you'll begin the journey of getting to know him. By the way, you know what Jesus says eternal life is? This is eternal life that you may know him. 
The sin that separated you from God is removed and you now have a relationship. And we as Christians, the rest of our days on earth in our eternal life is to get to know him better. And the more we know him better, we read the outcome in Psalm 139 today. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I pray today that God encouraged you from his word. This passage encourages me all the time. I love it. The youth group laughs at me because they say, you said last week this was your favorite chapter. <laughs> but I will tell you, this is one of my all-time favorite chapters. It really is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience that even those of us who have trusted in you as our Lord and Savior, so many times we fall short. But thank you, God, you promise to always be there when we draw near to you. And Lord, I pray today that all of us who know you as our Lord and Savior will draw near to you today and say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Change us, O God. Change our hearts. And Father, if there's anyone here today who's never trusted in you, I pray today would be the day that their new life would begin with you. They would be born again and begin the wonderful journey of getting to know you in a deeper, more intimate way. Thank you that you, the creator of the universe, would want to call us children. Thank you for making a way that we could be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.